Hello again, everybody. This is Derek, and I am coming back at you with another Wargaming and Miniature video. And in today's video, we're continuing on with our O Group Boot Camp. And if you've already checked out our introduction, we, we went over, like, basing and uh, figure scale and ground scale and time scale and what kind of equipment you would need, like dice and markers. In today's video, we're going to hit Chapter 2, The Battalion, and we're going to break that down. And then we're also going to hit Chapter 3, which is Troop Ratings. All right, so let's go ahead and talk about Chapter 2, which is The Battalion. Uh, the Battalion. Well, there's a couple of different methods that you can field your battalion in. One is to follow a historical order of battle, which will allow you to de deploy your battalion according to what actually participated in the battle you're trying to recreate. Or two, you can use the point system, which is later in the book. The point system is located in chapter 18. So when we get to that, we'll be going over that. But uh, just know each nationality has an army list of an infantry battalion. Some, some of them have multiple different types of battalions. But overall, most battalions follow the same set of organizational rules and we're going to go over those they're general okay what you see on the table here is a british infantry battalion your standard british infantry battalion uh world war ii battalions were generally organized into a core of the battalion headquarters company which i have right here this is my this is my battalion headquarters company accompanied by three infantry com companies this here is an infantry company this is an infantry company and this is an infantry company commanded by a company commander which i have there and added to this core battalion were regimental and higher level supports, which we'll get into those when we get there. Okay, so how to organize your battalion. The battalion headquarters. The battalion commander and his headquarters are represented in the game by a single battalion headquarters unit. The headquarters unit uses its headquarters order to either issue orders to battalion units or to influence the chances of winning the initiative. Players will have to make a strategic decision on how many headquarters orders you want to use in a turn, or you can save them for your following turns. The headquarters orders are usually kept track of by using like a D6 uh, located either near or on the base. Um, I, I personally left this spot open so that I could put the die right there on the base with my troops. And this is a variable number. It can go up and down. So it's with a maximum of six. So a D6 would be uh, sufficient for that. Each battalion also receives a forward observer which I've got my Ford Observer and his radio jeep right there. This is your battalion's dedicated artillery spotter. The FO can be used to spot for either battalion mortars or the offboard artillery support, which I have represented here by three 25-pound guns. So the battalion headquarters has two attributes ability and morale okay let me let me back up when it talks about the battalion headquarters having this ability or this attribute that actually pertains to your entire battalion and it has more than two it has three from what i can tell the battalion headquarters 
has two attributes. I'm saying three. Players determine these attributes if a specific scenario or use the point system. So uh, the scenario will dictate what kind of uh, stats that you have, or if you're using a point system, it'll fall into a number of points. And we'll get into that again back in chapter 18. Okay, so here are the here are the two that they list, even though they list three. You have the battalion ability, which is either first rate or second rate. Uh, first rate headquarters are the majority of British, German, between 39 and 44, and U.S. It can also include superior German in 45, Russian, Axis allies, early French, and low country battalions, if the scenario dictates. But usually, first rate is British, Germans between 39 and 44, and the U.S. Pretty much everyone else is a second-rate battalion. So the second-rate battalions are Russians, Axis allies, French, Low Countries, and Germans in 1945. Okay, I suspect that's because it's young boys and old men. It can also include poor British, German, or U.S. battalions if the scenario dictates. And first and second rate will be detailed in Chapter 7. Okay, Battalion Reserve Doctrine. This is the third one that I don't think they have listed. You either have flexible reserves or rigid reserves. When you deploy, I'm, I'm going to jump the gun a little bit here and let you know. When you deploy on the table, the majority of your figures or your platoons are off the table in reserve, waiting to be brought onto the table. That's the way the majority of it works. Flexible reserves mean that first-rate German and U.S. battalions have flexible reserve doctrine. This means that the reserves, like if you've got a reserve machine gunner, he would just sit off table with the rest of your reserves. And when you bring a platoon on, if you wish to or not wish to attach that machine gun to your platoon, you're flexible. So you have a choice to do that. And you can do that at any time in the game, and you don't have to allocate that at the start of the game. So that's just something sitting off to the side, waiting to be brought in. Send me in, coach. Now, rigid reserves, which would be all other battalions, so other than first-rate German and U.S., all other battalions use rigid reserves. That means all supports, including those in reserve, must be allocated to a company before the game begins. And this cannot be altered. So the British are all other battalions. So they would be rigid reserves. And if I had a machine gun, and I wanted, and at the start of the game, I would have to choose which company it would be assigned to. So if I assign it to, let's say, third company or Charlie company, when I bring in one of these platoons, at that point, I can attach it to that platoon or not. Instead of it being allowed to be added anywhere, you have to choose the company in which it's attached to. Okay, and then the, the last one is battalion morale. The last attribute, I should say. Battalion morale represents the overall enthusiasm and determination in battle. Uh, and there's two categories, or two grades. There's combat effective, which is the standard for most battalions, and tenacious. Okay, so tenacious is a superior morale. So you've got like everybody's eager, ready to go, they're combat effective. And then tenacious means that their morale is super high and they're ready to rumble. A superior grade 
will be like British paratroopers or Russian guards or some German battalions. Second line and green battalions cannot be tenacious unless large. Okay, so let's talk about large. The next step is battalion size. Uh, but remember, large battalions, and we'll talk about that here in just a second, are always considered tenacious unless your scenario dictates otherwise. Like maybe you've got a 1941 battalion, uh, I'm sorry, 1941 Russian battalion. Even though they're large, they're not tenacious. Okay, so let's talk about battalion size. Battalions are three sizes, right? We got large, standard, and or worn. A large battalion, okay, the, remember, this is the standard, right? You got three companies. Uh, you got the battalion commander, you got the battalion mortars, and you have an FO. A large battalion has at least three infantry companies and more than 10 sections of any type in support, excluding transports. So if I had an anti-tank battalion, I'm sorry, anti-tank platoon with its transports, that would still only be counted as two sections towards being large. Artillery does not count as figures. Let's say I attach a machine gun and piot, which is the weapons platoon. Let's say I attach that. That's two more sections. So that's still only four sections. But if I was to attach more than 10 sections, it would be considered large. A standard sized battalion, which is what this one is, has three infantry companies and no more than 10 sections. So if I added tanks and reconnaissance vehicles and, and a second company, well, a second company would count towards this. So if I add a Delta company, that's nine and 10. So that would get us close to being large. And then if I added one more base of something, then I would be a large, would be considered a large battalion. A worn battalion only fields two companies and has no more than eight added sections. Remember, transports are not counted towards those sections. Battalion headquarters on or off the table. Players can choose whether to deploy the battalion headquarters model on the table edge or accept that the headquarter, as in reality, would be some distance to the rear or off table. So this is one thing you do not have to field. You don't have to have a model of a battalion commander. I just like to do it. This stand can be considered off the table. Same thing with the mortars. The mortars are actually part of this headquarters element. They can be off the table. So technically, you do not even have to field these miniatures at all on the table. I just like to do it because if I put the mortars out, it reminds me that I have battalion mortars and I can place my order counters next to the uh, battalion mortars, letting me know when they received orders, etc., etc. Now your FO does deploy on the table. Uh, your 25 pounders do not need to be deployed on the table. I deploy or I place my uh, artillery fire missions on the table based on how many fire missions I have in that scenario. So if I have three fire missions, I will have three miniatures. And then as I use the fire missions, I just remove 
one of these from the table. So technically, these also are only counters or tokens. And you can keep track of that using paper or a die on the edge of the table or however you want to keep track of it. The one advantage of having the battalion headquarters on the table edge is that it can act as an aid to remind you that you have headquarters orders and you can place a D6 next to the headquarters model. This is adjusted when orders are gained, used, or lost. If you do place the headquarters on the table, then it cannot be hit or targeted by the enemy because it's really just because it's technically off the table. You know, it's in the rear with the gear. Company commanders. That's these guys right there. Now, I've based them on round bases to distinguish that they are not part of the fighting platoons. These represent company commanding officers exercising tactical command over their units. Each company fielded receives a company commander represented by a command base. Heavy weapons companies do not field a company commander. Now, it says it's useful to note the commander's base, which company he commands. What I've done is I've color-coded the edge of the base. Uh, like this is gray, this is English uniform, and this is green, a deep green. So those are the color codes for the companies. Uh, I've also color-coded the combat patrols, which we'll get to here in just a moment. Okay, the infantry platoons. There are uh, generally three infantry or rifle platoon, each of three sections. So these are three sections. That's what the British call a squad. So think of it like three squads, three, it's divisible by three, etc. An infantry platoon operates as a single tactical unit. Individual sections are not given separate orders or actions. So I don't give an order to this guy and move him around. I move this, I give an order to this platoon and I move the platoon as a whole. There are cases when you will give a section an individual order, but we'll get into that in a moment. It's not part of the that's not part of your companies. Those are supports. So that's a little bit different. Okay, platoon types. You have rifle platoons, which is 99% of all the platoons you'll see. Each section is armed with rifles and light machine guns. When you mount your figures, you can spread out your riflemen, your submachine guns, your light machine guns your uh, submachine guns, your piots, anti-tank weapons, uh, anything like that. Uh, now, there are platoons that are called limited light machine guns, so they lack the light machine guns, and what you'll do is you'll apply a poor training characteristic, and they'll lose an additional D6 when moving and firing. And we'll get into all that. Usually the Belgians, the Poles, and the Italians. They often had automatic rifles or submachine guns instead of a light machine gun. This does not apply to the U.S. infantry with M1 Garands and ready access to Browning light machine guns and or two BARs per section. Uh, okay, so if this was you like the, like the Brits, they would be carrying Bren guns, right? And they consider that to be a light machine gun. The Americans have like the the nineteen seventeen, which is a machine gun. Uh, but there were times uh, that the American paratroopers had only BARs and not the light machine guns. But it doesn't matter because they consider the M1 Garands and the BR, BARs to make up for it. Okay, another type of platoon is the submachine gun or SMG platoon. 
uh, armed with fully automatic submachine guns, such as the Russian PPSH. Uh, they have a significant advantage at close range and in close combat, but have poor range due to their inaccuracy of the submachine gun. Uh, and very few, if any, light machine guns in support. And the Russians fielded numerous submachine gun armed companies. Okay, a Panzer Grenadier Platoon. We, we all know what these guys are. They're German Panzer Grenadier Platoons, which is a little bit different than just a regular German Grenadier unit. A German Panzer Grenadier is a, is a, um, a special type of unit. They were based on two machine guns per section, uh, organized with fewer active riflemen. These platoons gain a rate of fire bonus and have increased firepower, that's dice, especially against close targets, but they automatically lose close combat draws to reflect the lack of dedicated riflemen. So Panzer Grenadiers in close combat, they fight like anybody else. It's just that if there's a tie, they lose. Okay, there's also engineers. You got assault engineers and pioneer platoons. These have specialist training and equipment, and they're either armed with submachine guns or rifles. Assault engineers gain benefits in close combat and are usually the only units that may use flamethrowers. Players may also equip other platoons with flamethrowers for specific operations, such as like D-Day landing. Okay, the assault rifle platoon. Uh, starting in 1944, the German units began to receive the Sturmgewehr 44. Looks a lot like an AK-47. Uh, a fully automatic assault rifle. Assault rifles are potent weapons with the range of rifles and increased firepower at close range and in close combat. Cavalry platoon. All cavalry platoons are assumed to be armed with the standard infantry weapons and once dismounted, are classed as standard rifle or submachine gun platoons. When taking morale tests, mounted cavalry are always counted as green. Basically, a, a morale test is has nothing to do with... Well, let me rephrase that. A morale test in this game represents your saving throw. So when you get shot at, you make a morale test to ignore certain types of hits. But cavalry are treated as green because they're easier to hit. Finally, there's the square platoon. Now, in the early war, uh, there would be four section platoons. So instead of three sections, they'd have four sections, and they would be called a square platoon. Okay, so there are platoon attachments. Most infantry, okay, integral platoon anti-tank weapons. Most infantry platoons have an integral platoon anti-tank weapon. Okay, prior to 1943, this would have been like an anti-tank rifle. And after 1943, this is generally a rocket-propelled anti-tank weapon, like a bazooka, a Panzer Faust, Panzer Shrek, um, Piat. Uh, integral anti-tank weapons do not need to be represented by any additional model figures. Well, I put a few of them in there just to kind of fill up my platoons. Uh, and remember, you don't have to base your figures like this. Uh, basing is left up to the players. Um, but it's best to have both sides based similarly. So if you and your friends want to base your guys differently, or if you want to provide all of your figures for the whole scenario, and you base all your armies the same, everything's fine. Two or three figures is the standard per base. Uh, so if you're short on figures, and you want to just put two figures, that's perfectly fine. Uh, it's however you want to do because the base is what counts. So all platoons are assumed to have such a weapon, but there are a number of early war exceptions, like the French in 1944. I'm, I'm sorry, 1940. Uh, most, pl most platoons will have, or I should say some platoons will have 50 millimeter 
or two inch light mortars. They're included in the platoon's firepower and do not also need to be represented, except I've got a few two inch mortars in there. Heavy weapon attachments. An infantry platoon may have one permanent heavy weapon attachment, either an anti-tank section like a Piat, right? So I could attach this to a platoon. A 60 millimeter mortar, uh, which are the larger than two inch mortars, like the American paratroopers would have a 60 millimeter mortar, or a medium machine gun. Okay, there's a medium machine gun. Maybe he would be attached to that section, possibly. A maximum of one section may be attached, either medium machine gun, mortar, or any tank. Once attached to a platoon, the section adopts the troop rating of the platoon. If this is veteran, then once he attaches to that, he, he's actually considered to be veteran as well, which you would assume. If attaching a heavy weapon, then just place the model with the platoon. An infantry platoon cannot have a heavy machine gun a gun, an AFV, or an FO, or a company commander. You can't attach guns. You can't attach tanks. You can't attach the FO, or a company commander, to a platoon. Okay, so heavy weapons. What are, the, what are they considered? Medium machine guns. Those are basically like tripod uh, MG42s, or Maxims, or 30 cal Brownings. Anti-tank sections, such as bazookas or any tank rifles. And then there's 60 millimeter mortars, basically infantry support mortars, such as the US M2 or the French MLE 1935. Heavy machine gun sections, for example, the Ma Deuce, the Browning M2 50 cal, the Russian DSHK, these can only operate in a standalone sustained fire mode. So like a heavy machine gun operates independently in its own little platoon. Now due to its larger caliber, heavy machine guns are, all, are considered as firing HE when engaging infantry and gun targets. So like if you're shooting at an anti-tank gun, it's still, it's counted as HE even though we know it's not. It's just heavy caliber. And they move as light guns. So you have to, they don't have infantry movement. They move as light guns. And the player decides how these heavy weapons are deployed. They may attach individual heavy weapon sections to, not, not, the, not the heavy machine guns, but the other sections, may be attached to infantry platoons where permitted, uh, or they can group them together into a two-section platoon, or deploy them as individual single sections. So all those support elements can be deployed as a single section, and in that case, it would receive orders. AFV platoons. An AFV, or armored fighting vehicle, are made up of one or two sections. Most tank platoons or troops had between two to five tanks. So, to, so for ease of play, we assume AFV platoons have a standard strength of either one or two tank sections. A tank section is represented by one model. Each AFV section is treated as a separate unit for shock and morale tests. So when I shoot at an infantry platoon, I'm shooting at the entire platoon, not an individual base. So it'll take damage, etc., make morale check, checks and stuff as a platoon. But when you're shooting at tanks, you actually shoot at individual section. And AFVs are divided into eight armor categories based on their weight and armor. And that'll be discussed in chapter 14. All right. Gun platoons. Gun platoon is made up of one or two sections. A gun section is one model. So far, everything falling into place? Hope so. Each gun section 
is treated as a separate unit for shock and morale tests, just like armor, if deployed individually. Otherwise, the platoon is treated as a single unit. Okay, so what we're talking about is, if I deploy two guns in a woods, and as a platoon, you shoot at it as, as the infantry, like as a platoon. The advantage of this is I can give one order, just like I give one order to this platoon, I can give one order to this platoon, but both guns will fire, right? But if I have these guys deployed separately, then they are considered two separate units effectively. Okay, now guns are divided into two game categories, light and heavy. Light guns are anything up to 70 millimeters, and heavy guns are 75 millimeters or larger. Infantry guns and pack howitzers, 75, are still considered light guns. If it's a, because they have small frames, easy to move, etc. They're still considered light guns. Okay, the last one, reconnaissance platoons. AFV reconnaissance platoons have a standard strength of either one or two sections. Each reconnaissance AFV section is treated as a separate unit for shock and morale purposes, just like a tank. An infantry reconnaissance platoon is made up of two to four sections. Infantry reconnaissance platoons could be motorcycles or jeep-borne units, up to four sections. Platoon integrity. What they're talking about here is how close you need to be to be considered deployed as a platoon. And it varies. So keeping a platoon in command. The command radius rule in O group works very simply. Infantry platoons always operate as a single unit. AFV, gun and heavy weapon platoons can operate as a platoon or can be split up and operate as individual sections. So you can spread those sections out over any distance. But they'll have to be issued their own actions. And it will become very expensive in terms of orders used and it will seriously impact upon your ability to command your battalion. Because you, you never have enough orders to get everybody to do everything. So you have to pick and choose who you're giving orders to. And if you've got multiple supports spread out all over the place, and they're eating up your orders as well. So command distances. Each section of an infantry platoon must be within two inches. So it's basically like a two inch. That, that would be okay for a infantry platoon. Um, I usually just keep them super close, but if you want to spread them out, you definitely can. They, have, they must keep in command distance at all times, unless they're forced by enemy action. So let's say I had my guys exactly two inches apart and this guy gets killed. And now these guys are more than four inches apart. Well, the first thing they do must be to move into cohesion. Gun sections are in command if within three inches. So when you've got your anti-tank guns, and they're separated by three inches, they can still be considered a platoon and not individual sections. AFV sections with radios can be up to six inches apart and still be considered as a platoon. And AFV, I'm sorry, radio equipped AFVs can also operate as individual sections they can move around the table but at that point they're actually considered individual sections just like before now afv sections without radios 
are in command if they're within three inches of each other, just like a gun. Not, now, special note, non-radio-equipped AFEs are Poland 1939, France and Low Countries in 1940, Russia up to 42, and Italy up to 41. The majority of AFEs had radios by 1943. Now, non-radio platoons must always operate as a platoon and cannot voluntarily split up. Now, there is a restriction to platoons. They cannot... Now, this is all platoons. They cannot be combined or merged with other platoons during the course of the game unless exercising the infantry re-squatting option. So let's say this guy's got a, a section destroyed and this guy's got two sections destroyed and you want to combine these two platoons to make one platoon, you can. The advantage of that is instead of having to issue two orders, now you can just issue one order. A limitation to re-squatting is uh, mixed platoons can't be re-squatted. So you can't take a, an engineer and re-squat it with a rifle. Or you can't take a submachine gun platoon and re-squat it with uh, an engineer platoon, or etc. Okay, artillery support. Uh, there's two different types of artillery support for the battalion. We'll talk about that later in section 15 or chapter 15. But the two are battalion mortars and artillery support. Uh, the battalion mortars are like three inch mortars, like those guys, 81 or 82 millimeter mortars uh, directly attached to the battalion. Uh, and they can be called in every turn using orders. Now, artillery support represents a higher level of artillery assets not organic to the battalion, like the regimental artillery or divisional artillery. And there's no need for artillery models on the table, as these would be some distance to the rear or off table. However, you can represent them with models and remove them just like what I'm doing. So, like... The British have three fire missions, and so if they use one, then I just take one of my models off the table to, to let everyone in the world know that I've used up one of my fire missions. All right, let's jump to Chapter 3, Troop Ratings. Now, I'm going to put something on the screen uh, in a bit so that you can kind of see what I'm talking about. Yeah. Let me just go ahead and put that up on the screen right now. Um, I'm going to put the troop ratings up here so you can see what I'm talking about. But <clears throat> each troop is given a rating. Uh, the standard, most common troop rating is 4+. plus. Uh, this is the score on a single die that you have to roll to pass your morale test lower the rating the better so if you want if you had a three or a two that would be better because you it's easier to roll a two or better than it is to roll a four or better and if you roll under the rating then you fail okay let's start at the pretty good troops veteran troops veterans are rare well trained and significant battle experience aggressive attitude with exceptional leaders uh, they're usually they could be battalions of engineers, paratroopers, special forces, etc. Okay, confident, well-trained with battle experience, good morale, aggressive attitude. These could be British paratroopers and Russian guards, good Canadians and Commonwealth units, experienced Germans, such as the Gross Deutschland or Tiger tank crews, Russian Guards or Shock Units, U.S. Airborne and Rangers, and Good Reconnaissance Units. So Confident is just a little bit better than Regular. 
the vast majority of reasonably well-trained and motivated troops, tanks, and guns, with a broad spectrum of leaders and some battle experience. Regular is the baseline, and you can go up to confident or veteran or what have you. Second line troops, remember those? This category can be used to represent infantry who were reservists, less motivated, or battle-weary. These can include poor French, Belgian, Dutch in 1940, or poor Italians, 41 to 42, some U.S. in 43, and some Volksgrenadiers from 44 to 45. Green troops, pretty bad. Troops with very limited training, no real battle experience, poorly led, or brittle morale. These can include Russian conscripts, or many German Volkstrom or Ost battalions. Now, AFVs, armor fighting vehicles, and guns cannot be rated as green. Most gun or tank crews needed to have at least some training. AFV crews with limited training can be represented, including them with the poor AFV category. Okay, let me reread that. AFV crews with limited training can be represented with poor AFE category. Mounted cavalry are classed as green units until they dismount, regardless of their actual rating. That represents that the mounted cavalry are vulnerable to enemy fire. As we talked about before, they're large. Okay, the company commander have their own commander troop rating, irrespective of their nationality or battalion quality. So, commanders always have a 2+. plus. Forward observers are also treated as commanders, so he would have a 2+, plus as well. Poor AFVs. This category is in addition to the troop rating. Poor AFV modifiers relate to inferior tank design and as such suffer disadvantages when spotting and firing. So, a regular tank unit could be rated as poor in the AFV because of inferior design. And then there's poor training. Russian regular infantry, second line infantry, and all infantry platoons that lacked light machine guns lose an additional D6 firepower if they move and fire. Platoons are not doubly penalized if they are, say, second line and have limited light machine guns. And then here's the table. Right, if you look at the table, it says troop rating along the top. You got your troop type along the left. You got like commander, veteran, confident, regular, second line, and green. Okay. And then going from left to right, you got the morale rating, the rally rating, and then other modifiers. So let's talk about morale rating. Morale rating is your armor save. It's your save against taking damage. So whenever you take a hit, uh, you roll your morale per hit. And if you can roll that number or larger, you ignore the hit. So almost everybody, second line, regular, confident, are all four plus. That is a normal morale rating. Now, when you are obscured, or if you have, if you're in some kind of, if it's hard to see you, like you're in behind a hedge, you're in a building, you're in a wheat field, or something like this, then if you're not spot, we'll get into this in the combat section, but it actually improves by one. So it would be a three plus. I want to discuss this veteran line because I'm a little frustrated with that. Okay, let's look at regular or confident versus veteran. Now, remember what I talked about, about spotting, right? If you're in some kind of cover. A veteran that's in the open also has four. So he's no different than confident, regular, or second line. The difference is he has a 3-plus 
when he's not in the open. So let's say he's in woods or he's behind a hedge. All right, so I've got a problem with veteran because the four in the open is exactly the same as second line regular confident four. So basically it's always going to be a four unless they're obscured or in cover. And in which case they have a three just like everyone else because everyone else also has a three when obscured except for green or commander. So I don't, I think that's a typo or it needs to be worked out a little bit better in my opinion. Now when you're talking about the rally rating, the next line over, that is when you've taken hits on your platoons and you give the rally order to your troops, you roll the die to see if you can rally off those hits. And confident and veterans, they do have a three, but the uh, regulars and all the way down to green have a four. So again, regular four being the base. Now, veterans do have an advantage when it comes to shooting. So if you look at the other modifiers, they hit on four, I'm sorry, three or better, where in a and any tank on a six or better, where everyone else hits on a four or better and any tank on a seven or better. So they basically get a plus one to hit. All right, well, that was the end of this video. In the next video, we're going to talk about the initial deployment of your troops uh, and how to deploy them on the table uh, because you have to roll uh, your initial deployment dice to see what the what the results are, and then we'll also touch on combat patrols, which I didn't really talk about here on the battalion, but let's talk about that real quick before I let you guys go. These guys here are combat patrols. Uh, they are tokens. They can be represented by anything. You can use a poker chip. You can use a two-inch disc. You can use whatever. I personally like to lock them up and put a couple of base, a couple of figures on the base to represent the their guys from your company that are out on patrol. Um, you need three of them per company uh, because this is what's normally on the table. These guys get deployed using orders on to these so we'll talk about combat patrols when we get there but basically you're they're used as uh like blinds so you move like a like a dummy counter you move them around on the table they don't have to represent a platoon or they can represent a platoon if you want them to but you don't have to record it on any paper or anything off off table and when you move them you're Basically, they are, they don't fight or anything. They just represent locations of potential locations of troops. All right, so that's the end of this episode of our boot camp. Continue staying tuned to this channel. We'll be going over the rules gradually as we go along. And hopefully you can learn these rules and hopefully um, it inspires you to maybe pick these rules up from two fat lardies and start playing. All right, guys, I'll catch you in the next one.